Guys, we're really fortunate today. I think most of you know Catalin, even if you've never met her, you probably uh, know about her. So um, she is originally from Hungary, did her MD and PhD there, and Albert Einstein for residency and fellowship in nephrology. She has since then produced, I mean, been one of the most prolific uh, and impactful uh, writers, in that, in, especially in the genetics of kidney disease. And if you just look back over the last year or two, you see papers like Science and Nature Medicine and Nature Genetics. I mean, all the top journals um, she's publishing in. So she also speaks a lot, if you glance at her CV, all over the world. So <laughs> we... Uh, are very, very fortunate to have her here today at Arcana to be able to hear um, some of the work she's doing at, in Trident. And uh, she said she might branch out into APOL1 or into uh, single cell RNA seq. So <laughs> she, does, she does a lot of uh, diverse research in kidney genetics. So if you have questions on any of it, I'm sure she's happy to answer those today. So, Catalan, thank you so much for, for being here with us today. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for giving me the tour of this very impressive place. I, I know you're from Twitter, but it's, it's, it's really <laughs> uh, so many, and it's the biggest place. So I was, and I was playing around what to talk uh, today. Uh, I am generally interested in chronic kidney disease development, and uh, I, I know your biopsy portfolio might be different, but you know it's it's. Close to 50% diabetic kidney disease, 25% so-called hypertensive kidney disease. So when I go to the clinic, those are the patients that I see. And of course, we have our interesting cases where we biopsy and send to you, and you know, in hope of you know getting this fancy diagnosis. <laughs> but but really, you know, what fills up our dialysis units are these these cases. So I'm actually interested in how diabetic and hypertensive kidney disease develops, and mm -hmm. I have interest in APOL1 because that's one of the factors, but, but not really in monogenic diseases where you really have a gene with a single mutation, you know, causing a specific disease, but, you know, this many genes, predisposition, environment, and so on. And um, I specifically decided to be this to my research focus. I moved to Penn about seven years ago because I know that the monogenic field is kind of saturated. We have so many mutations that almost it's uninteresting to find another mutation at this moment uh, because they are very rare. But I feel that um, our understanding of diabetic kidney disease and hypertensive kidney disease is very, very limited. Uh, and I think we need a lot of you know, teamwork and, uh, and putting uh, all of our hats together to kind of understand it. So today, I, I was toying around what to talk about, but I want to talk to you about this one, which is called Transformative Research in Diabetic Nephropathy, which I hope um, the UAMS actually will be part of it. It's a, it's a big collaborative research project. Uh, and uh, I heard that you have to give acronyms for everything, and uh, this is for that. Uh, and so it's a unique public-private initiative that aims to develop, you know, this fancy word, run-baking diabetic kidney disease therapeutics and understanding why some people will develop kidney disease and so on. The, the major component of this is that, that there is a lot of cohorts for these kind of, like right at my institution, there is CRIC, the chronic renal insufficiency cohort, but none of them actually have tissue samples. And many people feel that this is kind of boring, you know, you know, what are you going to see, and so on. But I don't think there is, a, we have enough. So what the key element is that we will actually, actually obtain tissue samples and directly interrogate it. So some of them is essentially doing what you're doing. So. I'm giving this talk because I'm hoping to get input from you <laughs> on the pathology side, but also we, we do a lot of molecular profiling and you know combining the genetics and so on, kind of to figure out why people um, develop kidney disease. And of course, this has an outreach component, I said, where we have blood and urine samples. Essentially, I know you hear this all the time, but replacing the kidney biopsy mm -hmm. with something that's non-invasive and so on. Of course, it's very difficult. Don't, don't we haven't reached this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just came over. <laughs> yeah, I know, sir. So, just to give you a, a background, so uh, on diabetic kidney disease, and and it is my understanding that when I surveyed, uh, I might have even reached out to you four or five years yes, ago, actually yes. asking for your caseload, like how many of 
how many cases you have and how many of that is diabetic kidney disease. And I feel that you gave the general um, answer that actually a very large percentage, mm -hmm. close to 40 or so, or was, uh, you know, have elements of diabetic kidney disease, even if it's not just pure diabetic kidney disease. That's my understanding. It varies, uh, you know, from north to south, actually, quite significantly, and so on. But for us, why this is important, so you may know that we made, you know, significant impact in, in treating diabetes. And uh, if you have diabetes, you know, the main cause of death was uh, cardiovascular disease. Cardiovascular disease death in diabetes came down by 70%, but ESRD due to diabetes is not budging so much. Um, and furthermore, if you have diabetes, um, you may know this data, but I think it's very, very important and I kind of uh, repeat this many, many times. If you have diabetes but you don't have kidney disease, you actually your adjusted risk of dying is not higher than the general population. And it's been replicated, this is a type 1 study from Finland, there is a type 2 study in, 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 from Sweden where there is a very, very tiny risk of dying with diabetes, but it's not really uh, always significant. And then your risk of death goes up uh, as soon as you develop different stages of kidney disease. And the risk of death of dying actually directly correlates with kidney disease development. And the way we interpret is that it's really kidney disease that may be driving mortality. Or the, you know, there's obviously some element of stress, but you see that what you, um, uh, what you explain by kidney disease actually explains all the mortality and then you may know that uh, you know that even though we have this you know we actually have really good drugs nine new drugs over 10 years for treating diabetes to the degree that for the general uh, internist is actually relatively hard to treat diabetes because everything is becoming so specialized with these new drugs now but as you see depending on the age when you when you actually get diabetes you still have a significant life year loss so it's important. The other important factor that I think we need to consider is that traditionally, when you went to medical school, we taught diabetic kidney disease like that, right? So you develop diabetes, you have a stage of hyperfiltration, then it comes down, and then essentially you develop uh, ESRD. At the same time, uh, you know, uh, albuminuria develops. And then that goes to micro, macro increases, and then you know essentially the two paths of albuminuria and GFR decline is parallel, and that's how we actually clinically, we, well, unfortunately, diabetic kidney disease remains a clinical diagnosis, which is a very significant problem for you know who are the people who are recruited for clinical trials. That's based on this, and this comes down, you know before probably Chris was born. This is from the 60s by Mogensen when we did not have insulin. You know, it's purely observational cohorts and it's based on like 100 people, okay? <laughs> so what we see now it clinically is something like that. So you have a, a, a large number of patients with microalbuminuria. You have a large number of patients with reduced kidney function. And there is an overlap between the two, but there is no full overlap. So these are the people with macroalbuminuria and the overlap between micro, micro and GFR decline and the macro. Coming up to close to 50% of patients with diabetes actually having kidney disease, but it's not that everybody with diabetes have, you know, reduced GFR and albuminuria. And probably you are getting cases as well. But what we are missing, and we kind of touched on that last slide, is we don't know how this relates to the gold standard definition of diabetic kidney disease, which is still histopathology, you know, the GBR thickening, as in my understanding, is still the most sensitive criteria. If you don't know people who have reduced GFR but no albuminin, what's their histological lesion? What is the difference between the two? So we have a disease that you know fills up our dialysis unit, but we really don't know uh, what's the manifestation of this disease. And that may be because, you know, the drugs, uh, the way we treat diabetes has changed. We have ASNR, we have better glucose control, or, forgive me, but, you know, some of these old studies were really, really small. It's really like 100 people, uh, you know, by Mogensen, which actually described that, oh, you have microalbuminuria that progresses, and then you have uh, kidney failure. So, the goals are essentially to get the tissue, get the urine and the blood, 
enroll a lot of people and do the sequential, uh, you know, uh, clinical data, histology, RNA, epigenetics, genetics, and so forth, profiling, and kind of correlate that with kidney function decline, okay? Uh, for, for pharma, I mean, for us, we could have set different goals, but for industry, really the key question is who's going to end up on dialysis, right? Who's going to progress fast and who's not going to progress fast? So therefore, the goals are articulated to identify pathways associated with rapid progression. Granted, we don't have a definition for rapid progression. We use these five and slow, and then use that by interrogation of the genetic, epigenetics, and gene, uh, gene expression profile from the kidney samples, essentially putting all the data together for everybody and see what we have, how does diabetic kidney disease look, I don't know, 60 years after medicine or something like that in the modern era, right? We have a lot of secondary goals and then if you have interesting, one of them is obviously histological and clinical markers correlate, like I don't know whether you know, but if you have data on that, I would be actually very interested whether the clinical and the histological lesions correlate in diabetes and that they're really something that, that in the histology predicts kidney function decline really in a reproducible manner. Uh, I don't have that and of course there is a lot of other things and then we put this together. So we needed a cohort uh, and then since uh, most of it came from industry, they wanted a cohort that essentially recapitulates prior successful phase two, three studies. So that's where they test their drug. And then if you get anything approved, we need to know what are the genes, pathways, and histology of those people. And just to review this with you, um, these are, we started this three years ago. So the, at that point, we only had these studies. These are the ACE and ARC studies for diabetes, renal and IDMP. Surprisingly, I don't know whether you knew this or not, but their average age was around 60, and their GFR was relatively low. Uh, this one had a lot of albuminuria, and that's how they were recruiting. But, um, you know, by modern standards, it was, uh, you know, relatively so-called advanced kidney disease, but this study was successful. So essentially, we know that if you use this formula, and then you have a new drug, you know, you can actually demonstrate success, please. Uh, that because uh, you know you, you because um, you know of the prior experience and pharma wants to recapitulate success. So simply put, uh, the other one is was the sonar. So sonar at that point recruited between 25 and 75. Um, they were also going for albuminuria. Everybody in the diabetes field goes for people with albuminuria, and they want it, and that's what their criteria. Of course, now we know that they actually get cancer. So. <laughs> uh, I'm going to actually show you results as well. <laughs> uh, so where, where are we so far? So this is, sorry, this I did not update it. This is uh, from last October. Uh, this is our target and so on. Uh, at that point, we had like 100 uh, patients. Now we are 156 or so. Uh, as you may expect it to somewhat surprising, this is only a very small number of patients, but mostly people tend to biopsy uh, patients with diabetes with a lot of albuminuria. And we had a very heterogeneous GFR from 90 to 4. Wow. I'm not sure how a patient with GFR of 4, I don't know, what, do you see this, <laughs> like the very low GFR? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what are we doing? I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, you know, then we have these. Uh, interestingly enough, um, they were all picked up as having AKR, acute kidney injury. So even though it was a GFR of four, that may not be the patient who ended up on dialysis. So we pick up a lot of this, and then you know there is a lot of data that that the AKI element might be actually important for progression. So that would be an interesting finding for us. And then uh, I didn't tell you the design, but we actually don't discriminate. So if you have diabetes, you're in one of the 18 centers, and hopefully now in Arkansas as well. You're eligible to be enrolled in Trident. We give you a consent and we take a research form from you. And then, uh, you know, all the other data comes via whole slide imaging to our pathologist, reads it, GBM thickening, diabetic kidney disease, and then we follow you because we're looking for the progression and we do these profiling. So they're indication biopsies. They are indication biopsies. But one but, of the cores is, is yeah. safe for 
one of the scores are safe for research. Okay. And then what you see here, that the mean is around 30, and then we have a very high albuminuria, so kind of relatively similar to the successful IBMT study. Yeah. Intuitively for us, it seems low GFR, but it's, 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 this, you know, it's the prior success formula. The other issue was that at that point, we didn't know about, um, uh, you know, about the risk and the safety of the biopsy. So one, you know, one thing that we would like to achieve with Trident is maybe if we, are, if we can actually demonstrate something that correlates with progression. I don't know what is the something. I mean, if we are trying to capture everything, trying to push that uh, either clinically or from the path to push people to biopsy people earlier with diabetes, essentially taking kind of an added risk, which is seemed to be relatively difficult at this moment, but maybe we will be able to change practice if we capture 400 patients with diabetes. So that's good business for you, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so we will work together changing the landscape, but I am really pro-biopsy. So mostly having proteinuria, there are variable GFR, there are patients with AKI. Uh, we have been thinking about excluding patients with low GFR, you know, kind of improving our GFR. Clinicians love to have like GFR and the biopsy, but it's not, there is nothing really uh, standing out why we should be excluding the, you know, the GFR of four because that patient actually get better. So we are going with the design and then we are capturing more. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this, but I'm curious to hear your opinion. Obviously, we are capturing um, uh, all the pathology. Uh, that, and then there is, I mean, I would be interested to hear your opinion. Currently, our idea is, you know, have all the elements in the kidney, the glomerulus, the tubules, the vasculature, and the interstitium, and use the scoring criteria essentially to make, to generate a unified database. So I like to work with data and then I like to have, you know, numerical categories that we can actually put into kind of uh, computational modeling uh, to see what correlates with kidney function, because otherwise the readings are, um, I'm not sure how your readings are, but otherwise it's too verbose. It's very hard to, you know, combine them. Um, that's where we are. Uh, I don't have the data on that, but now we have uh, results on a relatively large number of them, and it seems to be capitulated the Columbia biopsy series data. Uh, actually, even more, we have more than two thirds of the patients who are being biopsied uh, having a diagnosis of diabetic kidney disease. Actually, more than close to eighty percent, wow. I would say, have diabetic kidney disease. Out of that, I would say. 50 or so percent is pure diabetic kidney disease. Um, no, actually more than that, pure diabetic kidney disease. Then there are the people with superimposed diabetic kidney disease plus elements of something else. Mm -hmm. And then we have the, the other things of the, um, you know, the zebras of uh, amyloidosis or things that uh, probably um, keep pathologists excited <laughs> in the study uh, and we found uh, a lot of things. According to the Columbia biopsy series, uh, and then we don't have our full data yet, um, we can't really predict based on um, serology who's going to have diabetic kidney disease, who's not going to have diabetic kidney disease, except the years of diabetes. Uh, I think the other interesting factor um, from the pathologist's perspective would be for me is we using the GBM thickness as the entry criteria, as kind of the gold standard, um, or having this angel expansion, but that's a question, you know, is it the too sensitive criteria to include everybody who has GBM thickness into a study and call that, you know, quote unquote, they have diabetic kidney disease, because it seems that we are capturing quite a lot. Um, because you know, large percentage of the samples come from the south. So in the south, there is a lot of diabetic kidney disease. So they push up the numbers to be uh, a little bit more uh, with the GBM thickness than in the Columbia biopsy series. The other one is, I don't know. You know, that study is several years old, but uh, I don't know how they actually measure the GBM because I think if you do it in a standardized manner, the same way. Um, I think you get a little bit different data than, you know, just take a look. And then I think 10 years ago, it was mostly you took a look, 
you measure it a little bit and then you report it and sometimes I think it's so obvious that you don't have to do all that but I think for a study we, we decided I guess you know, the obvious thing is then for you know putting a grid of points and then the counting and then you know, there are a certain number of uh, cross sections that we count and that's how we call uh, the GPM. And we know what Matt Palmer is doing. <laughs> yeah. He's doing a lot of things, yeah. but like this is this is one of his elements that he's doing. But uh, you know, I'm curious to hear because many I think Agnes is very much proponent that it's really arterial hyalinosis. Is that what she's saying? That's that it should be colon diabetic kidney disease based on the arteries. Maybe mm -hmm. that would be a, it would that that is present. I doubt that that would be very specific, but it would certainly yeah. be sensitive. Yeah, you know, um, there, that is always present to some extent, but it's also present in other diseases as well. Is that what everybody else? Yeah. Is? Yeah. Yeah. And, the, and the issue of GBM thickening, um, we will see that just in patients who are hypertensive. Yeah. Um, there's, I don't think it's uncommon to see the synchrony between thickening and mesangial matrix. That's right. Yeah. From the point of view that we can see, basically normal GBM thickness in patients with nodular diabetic yes. change. Really? Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of variability. Wow. My, my feeling, Steve, tell me if this is you put, and if this is kind of anecdotal, but somewhat early in diabetes, you'll get thickening even when there's only very mild expansion. Yes. But then once the mesangium really expands like this, where it's nodular, it almost kind of like seems like it starts to regress and you have less thickened GBMs yeah. at that point. That was one thing I wanted to bring up. I think the reason, this is my opinion, but I think the reason for that is because if you look, it's because most of the time you're looking at GBMs that on in my areas of microaneurysm formation over nodules as it gets more advanced, right? Yeah. And I think they attenuate. But trying to measure GBMs and advanced diabetes is not necessarily easy just because of that. Yeah, issue. that's why I was saying that, yeah. that that's going to be a time-consuming project for, yeah. for whoever's <laughs> doing it. You're doing it too? No, uh, he's in QGN. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> Give you an update on the Columbia paper because I was yeah. the one who yeah. did that during my Columbia. Oh, yes, yes, oh, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, you yes, same reasons. That's why, that's why we didn't do GBM thickness because there's a lot of variability. Like smoking is also one of the factors. Mm -hmm. okay. So, we made it very simple. So, clinically, diagnosis of diabetes is important. So, whenever the clinician suspects diabetes, then we consider diabetes. And we divided diabetes only in two categories diffuse and modular, mm -hmm. not in the stages which was subsequently published, yes, yes. right? And you said like prediction of non-diabetic kidney disease. So duration was the only thing which was duration, yeah. But for prediction like non-diabetic kidney disease, superimposed on diabetes, complement is actually one of the very sensitive markers in the serology. Mm -hmm. So whenever you have low complements, chances of having a superimposed non-diabetic kidney disease is very high. Mm -hmm. It was I not, see. yeah, it, that was a very strong trend, but we didn't have a place to put it. But that is that was one okay. of the very sensitive things. So it's too bad Dr. Walker's not here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's He's uh, more, yeah. I think what six thousand yeah, diabetic yeah. kidney biopsies in terms of that one. Yeah, not with, correlation. Not with the detailed GBM. No, no. <laughs> in, in but, yeah, we're not going to do that again. Yeah. So, what is the purpose? Like, what is the? It's just kind of an expanded cohort. And that's it so for publication. A, a yeah. yeah. It's been in more so, so, so I have to be fair and honest. So the the criteria actually says. GBM thickening or mesangial okay. expansion. Oh, okay. My problem with the mesangial expansion, so I, I have to be honest, yeah. I am a number yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I understand To that. look at the picture, it's very disturbing for me because you know, even just this segment of the picture gives me so much information for me that I cannot quantify. Yeah. So, yeah. for example, mesangial expansion, I mean, I do understand that you you see it and you agree with it, but like I need I need something concrete. I, I'm afraid mm -hmm. that like you looking at that, you know, we're gonna be biased. I feel the point counting is yeah. maybe good. On the other hand, I you know, I I think so we capture all the samples, so nothing has been lost, but I think an important issue would be this, you know, have we missed anything? And then if we have like more sensitive criteria for diabetic kidney disease, you know. Should we go back to the people who we did not classify as diabetic kidney disease? Um, I don't know. Yeah. I am open and actually it will be very interesting about knowing what is happening with 6,000 patients with diabetes. Um, you know, well, you could quantify the, the mesangial changes. You could 
So DBM taking without Zango expansion, and Zango expansion without nodules, and the nodular to Zango expansion, they're going to want to have when you to put like a yeah. one, two, three, four number. That's that so new RPS like, classification scheme. Exactly. Yeah. You can kind of model that out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if you're doing morphometry, like say if you're doing host slide imaging and everything, you can, you know, create a total mesangial volume divided by the number mm -hmm. of glomeruli as well. So now we move this to, uh, you know, more computational analysis, but mm -hmm. as you know, that's in flux. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we are also trying to find features yeah. in here, but yeah. it's not, not, not absolutely obvious. I think one of the most interesting things to us too is the fact that uh, only about a quarter, I should mention, of patients actually develop end stage renal disease from the diabetes. I wonder, have you, is it possible for you to come up with any sort of quantification of nephron number? I mean, maybe oh, you're skewed, nephron. you know, maybe that's a group that's skewed towards, uh, you know, oligonephronium. Yeah, so, so technically we feel we will capture that because we do like epigenome analysis, genetics, and so on. So hopefully that will be captured in other mm -hmm. type of information. Mm -hmm. but Obviously, we don't have like an imaging component, which could be potentially interesting. And then we are looking for, to be honest, so the reason why I am going around, we are looking for anybody who is interested and have a question here, uh, you know, to work on the data set, and especially because we have full slide images. So if you're a pathologist and, you know, you have an idea in here, you know, we have all of this for you, you know, your EM, the IF, and, and then, um, and the whole slide images of uh, finding features of any of those. I don't want to disappoint anybody, but maybe you know my data is not very good. Um, we have a paper that will come out in Nature Communication. It's not as big. We had 100 patients. You may know that I collect tissue samples. 100 pa patients with nephrectomy, and then we did um, we did the whole gamut of uh, genetics, epigenetics, gene expression, and uh, quantified morphometry, which is Many, you know, uh, points, many characteristics right. that are counted, and over there, what what predictive progression is kind of the obvious things. Mm -hmm. Baseline GFR, right. yeah, massively <laughs> important, right? Yeah. Um, but but I don't want to disappoint you. Fibrosis and none of the things they did not stay in. It, so it's a complicated analysis because. If you have fibrosis, it's captured multiple ways. It's captured by the pathologist, it's captured by the gene expression, it's captured by the epigenome. So who's gonna be out under those? It's a competition of variables, right? So it's not like the pathologist doesn't see the fibrosis, but which one is more stable and maybe more reliable? And also the, for my problem, the gene expression falls out mm -hmm, under yeah. the equation, and then actually the epigenetics was the one that stays in. Why? <laughs> Simply put, A, I think we measure it in a quantifiable way. So, you know, it's really like by genotyping, it's numerical, and so on. It captures fibrosis, I'm pretty sure. Uh, also, it's not gene expression, right? Having a sip of coffee is going to change my gene expression. So the variability mm -hmm. in gene expression is greater, but in the epigenome, you are essentially capturing gene expression, but it's greater stability. So. The bottom line, we were able to add um, methylation on the top of the GFR, which is essentially 60% of your slope, in the predictive model using, you know, fancy words like machine learning, putting everything together. Uh, yeah. yeah, replication is of course needed, but that's, uh, you know, the data at face value. Yeah. Can I ask you a question about, gen I mean, in the genetics of diabetes, I mean, this is a highly heritable Type 2 yeah. diabetes has a very high concordance. Yeah. Um, so there's a, there's certainly a genetic component to this disease, the polygenic. Is, do you know about diabetic nephropathy? I yeah. mean, is that also? Yeah. So I have, heard? yeah, so so we have, a, I will show that, but uh, okay. Okay. I don't okay. have okay. slides. I make that too short. Sure. Yeah. Anyhow, so we have a paper um, uh, for type 1 diabetic kidney disease where the phenotype was ascertained by albuminuria. Uh, it's a bio archive, it's a big consortium with all the Europeans where they have the European cohort, the Pindain, and, uh, and so on. Uh, those genes, <laughs> collagen 4 genes, collagen 4 receptor genes, uh -huh. interestingly enough. Uh, the other uh, analysis is based on GFR. You know, GFR in, in patients with diabetes, the heritability of GFR is close to 50%. 
But those genes are going, uh, I have a lot of slides about those genes are going with the general GFR genes. So mm -hmm. plus minus diabetes doesn't That's seem to make a difference okay. for those genes for the GFR. <laughs> right. So maybe there are multiple, my hypothesis that it has multiple components. It's, it's multifactorial, but even the different traits, like actually uh, inherited maybe differently. Okay. Okay. Like different genes and coding. Okay. So what we do is we collect, we have also dissecting code, we get the uh, bromeduli and tubuli, we do the RNA and the things that we probably do. Um, we run them with a bioanalyzer, we sequence them. This is just uh, you know, a couple of them. And then you see differences in you know, genes that like, you know, natin and pedosin are very high in the bromeduli versus others. It's a relatively small sample size. Anyhow, just as a show, you, you know these kind of patients. This was actually the first three patients we collected. Uh, I'm going to go through relatively quickly. There are three people of almost identical age, reasonably same GFR, 35, 52, 42, right? Uh, there is actually a significant difference in proteinuria, right? The gentleman with uh, 52 had a higher proteinuria. Uh, this is uh, my corner. <laughs> uh, what you see is that there was a massive difference on the other hand in, in fibrosis and also in inflammation. The gentleman with the highest GFR had massive fibrosis, but also it was very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one, you know, even though this person had the lowest GFR, I don't know how, not so bad, and that kind of in the intermediate. So really the GFR doesn't tell us the histology, which is, you know, this very well, but, you know, the histology told us the slope because the gentleman in the middle had the delta GFR of 30, this one got better, and the other one went down in the middle. Um, there may be superimposed pathology here. I'm not, uh, if you look at closely, I'm not 100% sure that all three of them were through dialectic kidney disease, but they had the GBM thickening, and they had diabetes, and so they were quite different, right? And uh, the, the slope on the disc surface is very nicely correlated with the degree of fibrosis, which I think generally, I guess we agree on, I hope, I don't know. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure we could agree on everything. Anyhow, so as noted, you know, the major difference came out in immune cells and immunological things and metabolism, which my lab actually worked uh, quite, quite a bit. I will come back to these cases um, uh, a little bit. So I tell you, uh, I'm not sure I'm going to tell you about this, but there is actually a great interest uh, in the lab of annotating uh, variant, genetic variations with gene expression levels, right? So we all have a lot of genetic variations, about 5, 10 million SNPs that are different between us, and each of them contribute to very, very small changes leading to all being humans, but slight differences in skin color, eye color, boldness, hair, you know, hair color, and so on, right? So all of them, all of these are relatively small, so we can capture this uh, using some of these EQPL methods, which are for a tissue level, uh, you know, specific. So the general hypothesis for GWAS, uh, and I will be short here, is that the variants are not on promoters, but are in regulatory regions called enhancers. They quantitatively change the expression of transcription factor binding. They quantitatively change the expression of the genes, and this change is very small. Let me just repeat that. That change is very small. We all have differences in renal gene expression, but not a lot, and then that correlates to the small risk of disease. And so the idea is that GWAS essentially just annotates the variance with the disease risk, but if you do this, uh, you know, variant gene expression uh, correlation, we are actually able to correlate what the, you know, what are the genes that are regulated, and if, if you know, the condition fulfills both criteria, then we will call that this is the putative cause of gene that increases your risk of kidney disease development, uh, the current model. And then the really hope is probably here not the individual genes, because the individual genes, even in the monogenic disease there, is probably not absolutely critical. But what is interesting would be is to come up to a, a kind of a common mechanism or a common cell type that, you know, and uh, finally could be maybe targetable, right? 
uh, not, not necessarily individually, but, but all of them together. All right, so if this is, there are disease causing variants that are localized to cell type specific regulatory regions, regulate gene expression and alter uh, disease development. So this is uh, um, the current GWAS, mostly done under these three domains. I think there are 10 million variants, about a million people, a lot of GWAS will come out. This is actually not the real data, this is the old data that we annotated. This is phase three. Where you see overall sample size was about 100,000. And what you see here, that there are overall and non diabetic ones. But essentially, under if you do a GWAS for GFR, there is really not a huge difference when you do it in the patients with diabetes or in absence of diabetes, which would unfortunately speak against the fact that diabetes is a specific pathology, I feel. But it's my understanding, Chris tells me that it's indeed a specific pathology. <laughs> Because if you do this for like membranous, you have like this very, very clean specific genes in PLA2R. But when you do this for diabetes, you don't have this massive separation. Or we should do it in a very clean manner when we actually take cases with, uh, you know, with yeah. histologically yeah. confirmed patients with diabetic kidney disease. I would be interested in doing a GWAS on that. Yeah. And then that's the thing. So this is, um, this is a very clean population. So to capture the genetically driven gene expression changes, we, we, we created a very, very clean data set where you know, in the single ethnicity, uh, there was absence of cell type heterogeneity, absence of disease. So really, we can focus on what are the genes that are really just changing because the genotype is different between one sample to the other. We micro dissect it to the tubules and the glomeruli. And then do this CTPL analysis, and then we found 4,000 digital genes where the genotype and the expression of the gene correlated. Uh, just to completely disappoint you, this is like an <laughs> heroic exercise, as you could imagine, yeah. collecting all yes, the tissue and so on. Very little what we captured here is actually specific for the kidney. About, under these circumstances, we're able to capture about five to 600 genotype gene expression correlates that is not specific for the glomerulus and about the same now for the tubules because everything else is captured in big databases. You know, people who are doing something like a GTEx where they do this correlation in the blood or in the muscle and so on. So there are genetic correlations that exist that exist in the kidney and there is a very little that exists in the kidney. Uh, you can find these data sets actually in my website. If you go to the Schustack lab with ORG, you can punch in genes and genotype, and then you can correlate this. Um, and then we actually annotated this, and we were able to find about 24 genes where the genotype associated with GFR, and then the same variant changed the expression of the gene. Interestingly enough, which was now finally something really good, that the small number of genes that were specifically regulated in the kidney, almost all of them were the genes that were captured in the G1. So it still seems to be very useful to perform that. So it seems that the, this association has some sort of cell type specificity that happens only in the kidney. So the variants lead to kidney disease development and not other disease development, even though the variant is the same in the eye and the brain and so on. So, we worked on one gene specifically called DAP2, which is the SNP, where, which actually correlates with the GFR. The same SNP actually changed the level of this gene called DAP2, which is an adaptive protein. And I really don't want to talk about it, but there are methods to capture these regulatory regions with Chipsy. And then you can actually see that there are this area is in a regulatory region. So these are kidney specific tracks, these are macrophage specific tracks. This is um, seven cell types that are superimposed in, in a database. And you see there are these peaks that seem to be specific to the kidney. And there are these others that are essentially generic. Macrophages also have like specific peaks. So most likely, the reason why the SNP is associated with kidney disease, because it's a regulatory element somehow in the kidney, and specifically regulates the expression of these genes, and even though Consortium did a lot of analysis. They couldn't find it because it really only happens in the kidney. All right. Um, 
So the integration of history gene expression and genetic data is key to success. And I have to be honest, this is the route that we are taking right now. There's a lot of GWAS. And we really just want to find the genes, even though their effect size individually is relatively small. But maybe if we put them together, there are also genetic discourse, um, they kind of show some sort of some pathway that maybe we can target. So just to make sure I'm clear, you're taking like these intronic variants that are detected as significant in the GWAS. Yes. And then you're and then you're asking uh, it, what does this variant have? What effect does it have on expression of genes in, in the, the kidney, kidney compartment? Okay. Exactly. And in the same variant associated with the risk of kidney disease and alters the expression of the gene in the kidney, then that gene will be a candidate for kidney disease development. And I would still say candidate because I think we need um, you know, models and in other type of tools to show that these are truly contributing to mm -hmm. Now, this is most likely all of us risk for kidney disease development because it's very unlikely that in this room, if we are actually capturing anybody who has like an exonic mutation for kidney disease, where everybody has variations that predisposes you for kidney disease development, yeah. right? But they are relatively small. Well, the, the neat thing about this is potentially the hope would be that well, in all likelihood, diabetic nephropathy, for instance, is, is 20 different diseases, kind of. And there are multiple pathways right. involved. Yeah. And so your diabetic nephropathy may be different from my diabetic nephropathy. But if you can identify in an individual patient what pathways are involved in their disease, you could potentially individually target that patient's disease. Is that the So that is, that, that is the hope. Um, that is the general, like, precision medicine hope, sure. and I will, yeah. I will distill my views in the next okay, set good. of five to ten slides okay. that are slightly complicated to you. Um, so, precision medicine, I think, in a way that really specifying it has not really panned out right. because mm -hmm. we don't have large effect size variations that we can actually kind of partition the population, at least for these diseases. For QGM, for membranous, you could you you <laughs> have your you have you know where you have to work on, but but you know it's really not my patience, <laughs> unfortunately. All right. So here is the idea. So what we did is, um, as Patrick uh, alluded to this, we get interested in one very critical question. Even though this actually told us we need to work on this gene that too, we didn't know which cell to work on, right? There are many, many cells in the kidney, and this is still microdissection, so it's an average output of all the tubules or, you know, or the many cell type in the glomerulus. We wanted to know where to work on. If you read the literature on diabetic kidney disease, or you invite multiple people to speak, they will have their favorite cell type. It could be a vascular disease, for the side disease, a tubal disease, a macular tensor disease, a fibroblast disease, uh, an immune disease. You, you, you find, you know, just have to invite multiple people. You will have your cell type of interest, <laughs> right? We all know that. So same for that too. It's somewhere in the tubule, but like where in the tubule? And then we wanted to do it in a systematic way. And that's why actually our lab decided to do this kind of unbiased single cell sequencing. And then um, you can read in the paper, but essentially we started with animal models where we just dissociate the entire kidney because we want to capture every single cell type. And then essentially sequence every cell individually. We have 70,000 cells individually sequenced. We have their profiles, and then we put them together based on their similarities in this PSNI plot. You don't have to know, but by the way, just to let you know, this is old fashioned. Now we use a different kind of <laughs> plotting system. And, and then, so what you see is, which is not surprising, we have this big blob. This is most likely the proximal tubule. So what is interesting is, Traditionally, cell types are so-called morphotype-based, right? Morphotype is what you do. Mm -hmm. Morphotype yeah. is the color, the shape, and the location. And these morphotype-based cell definitions are very old. They are mm -hmm. actually with the invention of the microscope and the EM that didn't add too much. And the microscope was is 200 years old now. Yeah. So essentially, all cell types are 200 years old, but the cells have other characteristics. The cells have an origin. The cells have
have a state. The podocytes may be in, in collapsing gene may not be the same as the podocytes on the normal cell type, but it's still a podocyte, so we call that a state. So there are a lot of other information that this morphotype-based definition, and I hope you don't kick me out at this point, <laughs> is not capturing, right? right? So the idea is that if we do this different types of cell type definition, which is essentially a transcriptome-based definition, we will be able to capture, right? Right now, we're just like, uh, you know, analyzing the cells and then making this, uh, we call this atlasing, kind of finding the genes. And so, when we created, we were able to annotate these 16 cell types based on all type definition. Just to let you know, the projects have been wonderful because the most, the best cell type discriminatory gene actually correlated with the old fashioned, uh, you know, like old fashioned data. So, for example, nephrin is, is one of the highest expressed gene in podocytes. And now we did it independently sequencing 100 of podocytes. So it's really like you know a very good gene. Apoporin 2 is the highest and highest expressed gene in the principal cell, and then we did a very independent analysis, and that's the way. Immunologists are terrible. They <laughs> like <laughs> because they like convenience surface markers, right? So their cell type definition is not by the highest expressed gene, but convenience surface markers and fat sorting. That doesn't mean like CD4 is the highest expressed gene in the CD4 cell. It's just like we found this surface marker, so this is our cell type, and they added on a bunch of others, and then who understands how they, you know, what are they talking about? But that doesn't capture. So in the immune cell, this is, there is a big, I just want to, not, not to dwell too much, it's, it's not so easy to actually match the immune cells based on now transcript and then prior definition. So kidney cells, it's very good. Anyhow, so the hypothesis here in a different form is, so during cell type specifications, now we have more than 200 cells, probably we have more than that many cells. If a cell type has an important function, right, so then the cell types is maintained during evolution. But it's very, very hard to keep every cell in our body. Like during development, there is a lot of ways to lose these. So therefore, every cell, like an army, every cell has a specific function. So the hypothesis is that one cell dysfunction leads to one specific, we call this endophenotype, or subphenotype. So like reading this out in the kidney relatively convenient because our phenotypes that we are looking at are very quantitative, so Catherine likes quantitative stuff. <laughs> uh, so the idea is that now we have this map, and then we can just map the phenotypes to the cell. So the first one is a relatively easy case because we took monogenic nephrotic syndrome genes, we took this unbiased data set, and we took the omen catalog where you have all the mutations, and you check where the genes are expressed in the single cell data set. And when I still got to cry a little bit about the data set, and what you see here is these are all the cell types, and yellow is expressed, blue is not expressed. And what you see here, I was told they didn't capture all the genes, but anyhow, this is 27 of these genes. And then almost all of them exclusively expressed in the polycytes. What it means that these genes almost have a unicellular expression in the body, right? So actually the mutations are tolerated. You're born, uh, but your kidney is gonna be, your polycytes is gonna be messed up. The function of the polycytes is to protect you from proteinuria. So this is the disease that you cannot go down, right? So if you would have a gene that's broadly expressed, your phenotype would be, you know, manifest in multiple places, your brain, your eyes, and so on. But these are not, these have, seem, seems to have a unicellular expression. And we can read out the function of the cell. The function of the cell is really protect you from proteinuria. So then we went to this hypothesis. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what? I know this isn't the point of your talk. Yeah, what? Yeah, well, what about no, 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 no. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you probably get asked that a lot. Next slide. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so, uh, so we, you know, we, we, we constantly have to redo this, you know, this was the earlier one, and also this is mouse, right? Okay. So, uh, now we did it for other things, like blood pressure, so uh, maybe not so pretty also, but 
the map monitoring the blood pressure variant. So uh, Lee Clifton worked on this, you know, dark pressure extremes, the pink genes, and I think you should be happy to see this, but most of them are expressed in the distal collecting tubules somewhere in here. Also, this is the earlier data set, the cell type annotation may not be so perfect. And then we map the broad pressure G1, like using the same, like I explained to you this, variant gene annotation using EQTR. So these are like, you know, high confidence genes that this is really causing a uh, blood pressure experience. And then we see that they enrich on the same cell type. So they are also enriched in the VCT. The genes are completely different. There is no overlap of the genes that the mutation causes blood pressure extreme and the genes defined in the GWAS. But of course, we would like to propose that the VCT is maybe important for blood pressure regulation. And then we did it for you know multiple other traits. The best one to map is actually metabolite traits because uh, genes that regulate metabolite traits in the human body maybe not so surprising. Almost all exclusively expressed in the proximal tubule. All right. So now taking this to the next level. So this is the way I think about precision medicine or personal medicine. So kidney disease is relatively broad, but it has multiple endophenotypes, right? So one of them is decrease in filtration. And then when people do the GWAS, it's actually always just for filtration. And I don't know whether that's like the only trait in, in kidney disease, but that's what's important. And I kind of disclosed this to you, variant genes in PPL. But these genes uh, show enrichment in the proximal tubules uh, as opposed to others. And we kind of had a discussion with Honkos why the proximal tubule is important for GFR. But in a simplistic manner, there's a lot of people, if you have a polycyte dysfunction, you get proteinuria, but you don't get GFR decline immediately. If you have an APF that the your proximal tubule is a GFR goes to zero. I don't know why. You have your expert right there <laughs> who, who knows about your metabolism and tubules role. But I think in a simplistic manner, there is something that fundamentally we may not be understanding about, you know, how GFR is regulated. All right. But now if you have diabetic kidney disease, it's actually a very complex, like you said, so there are multiple phenotypes with your diabetic kidney disease. So you have high blood pressure. Some people have edema, other people have high potassium, but the simplistic way to think about GWAS, which has already been done, do it for GFR and do it for albuminuria. Under my hypothesis, one should be the regular GFR genes, the other one should be polycyte, and then I'm talking to you about it. So this is the GFR GWAS, I told you this is all in the proximal tubule, and in albuminuria, this is the Gini cohort, and it's collagen 4, BMP, BDR, and so on. So there is enrichment for the polycyte. So I think if we are thinking about precision analysis, I think what we could see is we can partition the phenotypes into narrower, more cleaner phenotypes. So diabetic kidney disease is a combination of high blood pressure, albuminuria, high potassium, GFR change, and then you can list. And I think we can find cells and mechanism for that phenotype. And actually, the, on an organism, on a patient level, these, the combination of these endophenotypes happen. I, I don't believe we will be truly partitioning diabetic kidney disease into subtypes. But we can understand why one patient has maybe more albuminuria predicted, more polycyte dysfunction. Others maybe have more GFR decline. The third one maybe having hypotonemia, and the fourth one has more high blood pressure because there may be these changes actually come together in slightly different proportion. And um, that's my hypothesis. Invite me back if it's true. <laughs> you don't have to back if it's not true. Uh, you can do this single cell uh, at the human uh, kidney. So Ben Humphreys had this paper of the of nuclear um, uh, so on, and then we have you know, a bunch of cell types in the human kidney. Anyhow. It's unclear whether it's really, to me, it's really worth it because what is very interesting is we have these computational methods which actually now take the bulk data and take some elements of single cell data and then we can give you cell proportions. Uh, this paper already came out in Nature Communication. Um, 
using a just computational method. And now we are working on an extension of this that you can actually read out some type specific differential expression as well from bulk data set if you have some level of single cell data. The first paper, you know, not probably enough, you need more data set. And then I have five minutes, so I will tell you one full aspect of this that I promised. So <laughs> The other way to try to read out changes is trying to actually sequence cells from the urine. So now we have some data for the human kidney. We have some data for the mouse kidney. It's not perfect. PLA2R1 may need to be found better place, but it's pretty <laughs> it's reasonably good. Uh, on an individual level, it's prohibitively expensive to do single cell sequencing, right? On bulk, we can probably afford it. But the better would be is to put it together with a non-invasive output, like looking at the unit. You have a lot of cells in the unit, right? So that's what we tried to do. So this is my entire blood five years ago. We feed in the cup and we get very little cells. <laughs> Only 600 cells that controls, like don't, we don't have good urinary sediment, like you may know that. But we get pretty good gene uh, determination per cell type. So now we combine that with our patients. Um, so this was the one, so now you see that it has other number, it has, so that's why it had this other thing. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, this guy was very good. It had 5,500 cells in the unit and pretty good gene uh, uh, cell number. And this one, um, I guess it was better. This was this diagnosis and then uh, it had only 600 cells in, in the unit. So, uh, reasonable variability, uh, we are trying to work, uh, we now have tried to do the standardized methods about stability between one month to the next one, 24 hour units, what unit, blah, blah, blah. It's really the patient, like some patients have more cells, other patients do not have a lot of cells. That's my conclusion. <laughs> but what is very good though, you can actually, uh, using these markers, you can actually identify most of the cells. Um, I didn't show the epithelial cells, but there, there is some epithelial cells, not so much. Um, so the patient with the membranous and inflammatory, that was the best one. And then what you see is that there is a lot of immune cell over here. And then so this correlates pretty well with the with this scoring of lymphocytes, eosinophils, and so on uh, over here. But you, you get rid out for endothelial polycytes and all of these cells. This patient has like not so many cells, but you still get in that. Um, so um, we did a correlation because now we have the kidney and the urine sample. Uh, this is for individual cell types. Um, so the immune cell the red is higher correlation. This patient is obviously better in here. Um, Polycytes, some of them seem to correlate better. You know, it's a small sample size, but so far we are sure it. At least for reading out cell composition may not be bad. And then whether we can read out cell type specific changes, disease specific changes, I think that's something that we would like to determine. But um, honestly, it's not bad. It's very, very hard to do single cell sequencing on human samples. There is a lot of, there are data sets out, but they don't, they are not, they're not on the quality of the mouse data that we generated. And it's not much worse to do the urine. At this point, because the cells are already, you know, isolated. So, this is uh, the website. Uh, you can go to them, and that was um, the group for the summer. I also like to do home party. So, <laughs> uh, so this is um, what I had. So, if you have any questions, I'm happy to Thank you. A few minutes for questions. I think, but I think we kind of asked a lot of them as we yeah. went. Yeah. But this is a really practical question, but we have a biorepository and we collect urine from some certain diseases. Um, it's what, 10 hours. Are, are there um, ways to do that? I mean, how, do you, how do you preserve the urinary? So that's control? just on the spot and we did on the spot. So first we want to see how it works and yeah. then you, you will try to improve it. According to Tenex and according to some groups, you know, it's, it's portable, like you can, you know, right transport it and you can still get good data you know you always go down on quality right um, yeah uh, so the question in my mind is what you can afford 
Uh, and then I think right now also, but the quality of single cell sequencing is improving. Mm -hmm. So you may want to wait a little bit until you know, yeah. that quality improves versus your, you know, biological problem, um, you know, plays in that you get an, you know, an outcome. Right. It's pretty expensive. It is, yeah. It is quite expensive. One thing that Catalan was telling me last night that I was surprised by was we have a very warped view of what diabetic nephropathy looks like as, as pathologists because, Joey, I mean, our typical diabetic patient, what, tell me the history. Uh, a CKD nephrotic lymphopenia, which is progressive and so right. biopsy. Six grams of protein. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And so in the clinic, it's usually well, progressive CKD, but they're, 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 they have no yeah. Little to no proteinuria. Half of them, the I know the half of them have no proteinuria. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the yeah, problem. But they're still developing CKD. CKD. And that's kind of the point I wanted to make. The, the data you showed about uh, interrogating specific cell types is really interesting, in my opinion, because not infrequently we deal with this dilemma that, by all means, the presentation sounds like a phototypopathy, you know, but we have our hands tied because the biopsy looks not to me. We just say, like, you know, it's part of diabetes. You have huge mesangial nodules, you have high window solutions, thick PBMs. Right. There's no way we can call a prototypopathy in that setting. And we just say, you know, you that's part of diabetes. diabetes. And yeah, yeah, it's part of diabetes, but not all diabetics behave like that. Yeah. So maybe those specific patients yeah. have yeah. a different expression yeah. in the prototype. Exactly. So maybe, so that's what I, the way I think about the disease now, you know, the contribution of the multiple cell types. So maybe the people who have this prototypopathy phenotype, Maybe they'll have a greater contribution of photocyte dysfunction versus the others maybe coming from, you know, the more fibrosis, maybe fibroblast or, I don't know, blood pressure, maybe BCT dysfunction and so on. Mm -hmm. So that would be, I think, I think in that setting, I would accept the concept of precision medicine mm -hmm. because we can, I think we can partition a disease into small endophenotypes and then, then you think about the disease as a combination of the multiple manifestations that you can read out in the smallest unit, which is the cell type. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my uh, proposition mm -hmm. for precision medicine. It's it's really really hard to find, uh, um, you know, just broad predictors, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and it's not be very fruitful. And you know, if we go there, it's going to be GFR. We know that. Yeah. Sixty percent <laughs> of progression is determined by the patient GFR. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's kind of amazing, though. Yeah. It's a huge number. What about the role of obesity? I mean, you're comparing data yeah. from sixty years ago yeah. the prevalence of obesity. I assume it's much there is more. a lot of data that obesity may be the factor that that's actually you know um, things. And so you know, we capture all clinical variables and go for mm -hmm. the and, and then maybe so it's going to come out. You know, we don't yeah. know. Well. Human diabetics oftentimes have so many risk factors for CKD other than diabetes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hypertension, obesity, hyperlipidemia, yeah, three yeah. in of themselves, and they synergize, and any other patient with diabetes is going to give them CKD. Yeah. So, uh, and, uh, so I, when I look at the morphology, do they smoke? Yeah, yeah exactly. Medications, PP off, many of them have GERD. PPIs and yeah. all sorts of different medications that are damaging have the potential to be nephrotoxic. So, you know, diabetes in of itself. That's why when we look at a biopsy, we're often looking at the morphologic changes in the glomeruli to tell us what degree of diabetic change there is relative to the patient's clinical history. Patients. And so if there's not a lot of diabetic yeah, so that, change. Yeah, so that's why I am proposing that, you know, that it's essentially a combination that we don't we could now dissect which factor mm -hmm. acts on which cell type, right? So right. I would propose that the PPIs may may act on the intercalated cells, right? Because mm -hmm. that's where right. the proton pump is. So, so maybe you can actually read this out if we if we now partition things into you know, where, like, like, for example, very important question, where, which cell type obesity act on? So I obviously propose that albuminuria act on cortisides, and the GFR seem to be enriched in the proximal tubule, the hypertension and the BCT, acidosis and the intercalated cells, but where is obesity? Which cell type should we think about? Or, you know, maybe that's not a single yeah. cell type, but, you know. Yeah. I love your thought process because you're focusing not only thought process and the thing which you say, uh, state of a cell is also very important yeah. because just the photocytes which you mentioned, 
the state of a photocyte in FSGS. Yeah. Diabetes. Yes. Diabetes with FSGS. Yes. Crescent like IgA. Is it a crescent or is it an FSGS? State of a cell is very important. So that is again will play a very important role. Yeah. yeah. So you guys work with us. <laughs> 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 we have uh, tissue, we have, uh, you know, we have data, and then we are looking for, you know, anybody interested in uh, giving us ideas how to use it. Okay. Really, there is a lot of information, and of course, they're always looking for, you know, 6,000 other uh, samples with diabetes. <laughs> 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 uh, but, you know, so I have a very big collection of more than 2,000 samples that are from nephrectomy. There's a lot of sample in there. There are patients with diabetes in absence of kidney disease. Um, so I think yeah. that would be potentially very interesting to review. In a, yeah. I mean, we try to review that in a standardized fashion, but like really putting it together. The other thing is that my cases are different maybe from yours. As we discussed, these, I see that over here, these indication biopsies seem to be replicating here, right? Yeah. A lot of proteinuria, relatively advanced GFR, blah, blah, blah. But the patients, that, the, 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 the samples that I have are from the general population. We have a lot of these no albuminuria, low GFR patients with diabetes. Um, or diabetes in absence of kidney disease. Well, I mean, I know the diabetes people really might like to know the duration of diabetes, but, you know, yeah. let's be honest, who knows the duration of diabetes? So that's an issue, but I think to review that in a standardized manner and then also show, compare show, it show. with the indication biopsies would be interesting because I think the samples we have may recapitulate the general population better. Well, let's, let's move on to the consensus conference. If you want to um, run and get your cases.